The following content is provided under a Creative Commons license. Your support will help MIT OpenCourseWare continue to offer high-quality educational resources for free. To make a donation or view additional materials from hundreds of MIT courses, visit MIT OpenCourseWare at ocw.mit.edu. Thank you for the introduction. I'm happy to be here today. I hear it's spring break, so I, I'm impressed that you're all here. Uh, it doesn't feel much like spring outside, but I'm sure, it, hopefully it will in the next couple weeks. Um, so uh, Priya and I are gonna talk a bit about uh, what we've been working on in regards to checklists. So it's a little bit, uh, I think it's a little bit different from some of the technology discussions you've had in the past, but I think the similarity is in that we bring, uh, the idea of bringing innovations and also implementing innovations in poor areas. And so I wanna start off by just giving a brief story. So uh, about a month ago, I went to Zambia. We were, we're one of our pilot sites is in Zambia. And as we were flying to Zambia, we stopped through Washington DC. And um, as we were coming down to the runway, could watch the runway, everything was going very well. And right before we were about to land, we took off again. As we were going up, we turned sharply to the left and then we just hit a whole bunch of turbulence. We started, the person next to me actually threw up. I almost thought I was gonna throw up. Uh, despite all that, we started making another approach to the, to the runway. As we were coming down to the runway, uh, we made another sharp turn to the left and then landed. And as we were landing, outside our window, we saw all these fire trucks kind of lined up right along the side of the <laughs> runway. And so uh, following that, the, the captain got on the intercom and said, Sorry we had this disruption, we had some trouble with our landing gear, uh, but we used our checklists and everything was fine, everything was safe. And so uh, I give that story because checklists began kind of being used for safety in the aviation industry. So if you go back several decades before, um, pilots were noticing that they were involved with very risk, a very risky and very complex um, system and a complex procedure that had very little margin for error. And for that reason, they developed these checklists to help not only remind them, but also to help them use uh, tools that may not be, um, may not be found, used very frequently. And so that, we see that in surgery as well. If you think of a surgical procedure, it's very complex. You have very many different procedures, uh, very, very different steps throughout that. Uh, but the commonality throughout the whole thing is there's a lot of risk involved with, with operating. And so some might say it's not as difficult as landing a plane in the Hudson, but I think it probably is just as difficult. And so I wanted to start off, give you a little background about what the safe surgery checklist is all about. So a couple years ago, the WHO uh, was considering kind of its aims and in considering uh, different diseases in the world. And so as they took a look at surgery, they found that surgery was actually very prevalent in the, in the world. Uh, it's estimated that about 234 million procedures are done a year, and this outnumbers the number of childbirths as well as the number of new HIV cases a year. And so as a result, this focus in looking at surgery developed. And during this time, it was also noted that a lot of complications that arise from surgery, uh, there were a lot of complications that arose from surgery, and in addition to that, many of these were preventable. So it's estimated about 7 million disabling complications worldwide occur a year. And in addition to that, about a million of those complications result in death. And so that's a lot of death, that's a lot of complications. Uh, if you look at these complications, it was also estimated that about 50% of these complications were preventable. Uh, if you think about s wrong site surgery, you think, well, that seems very, how could that ever happen? But it's estimated that about 1,500, 2,500 cases of wrong site surgery happen a year. In fact, my grandmother-in-law, I guess you'd say, uh, was having carpal tunnel surgery maybe about five years ago, and they actually did it on the wrong hand, wrong wrist. <laughs> and nothing bad happened to her. You know, it was, she was fine, but at the same time, it required her to go back to surgery again. It was embarrassment for the surgeon, embarrassment for everyone involved. In addition, that was, it was costly. And so these things happen. Uh, they're not, they, they're infrequent, but they happen. Uh, in addition to that, if you uh, consider essential monitoring in the operating rooms, it's estimated that about 82% of incidents that occur in anesthesia can be prevented by having just basic monitoring systems. 
for example, EKGs, uh, blood pressure monitoring or oxygen monitoring. Uh, antibiotics, which also are very, uh, not very commonly used in the developing world. Uh, it's been shown that if antibiotics are given within an hour of the incision, you can reduce the rate of surgical infection risk by about 50%. And so one of the things that we've, we came to think of is that uh, really in hospitals currently, hospitals do most of the things, most of the right things most of the time for most of their patients. But what we were trying to do was find a way in which we can uh, help uh, hospitals and help providers do all the things, all the right things to all their patients all the time. And so that's where checklists came. The idea for developing a checklist came. And so what I'd like to talk about today is talk about, firstly, the surgical safety checklist and the pilot study associated with that that was published back in 2009. And then talk about what I've been working with directly is looking at the sur surgical safety checklist and pulse oximetry in resource limited areas. And so, anyone, has anyone here, is anyone here a physician? we we'll ask the physicians to raise their hands. Okay, so we've got a couple. Anyone here a surgeon? Okay, anyone here ever been operated on? Okay, so we've got a lot of people who've been operated on. So I'm gonna bring you into the operating room. So this is a little glamorous here. This is, a, this is as you'd recognize, ER. So this is one of the nicer uh, operating rooms in the world, but uh, I just want you to, <laughs> I just want you to take a look at what's going on here. And so to preface this, this is a, a kidney transplant. Uh, I believe Carter is undergoing a kidney transplant. And so they're using the surgical safety checklist. So this is an opportunity for you to be exposed to it. Then afterwards, I'll talk a little bit about different parts of it and how it works. That's not too far from what happens in the operating room. I don't know if any, as we mentioned before, some of you have uh, been in medicine, but the operating theaters, surgeons can often be very um, pushy. There is often a very strict hierarchy. You know, the, 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 the attending surgeon is basically in command of the whole operating theater. People, as the interns or the nurses, may have difficult time speaking up. So these are some of the challenges that happen here. So I want to open up to you all. What do you think, what, do you, what are your thoughts about what, what happened here? Okay, why? Because when I saw you know, people arguing and fighting, and I was about to run, I was kind of nervous. <laughs> right, can you imagine an environment where these people are, tr are working together, but not really getting along? You think they can really work together very well? Probably not. Any other thoughts? Okay, so I'll, I'll start off with a couple. So there are a couple of points. So one of the, the hopes through development of this checklist was that it was to help improve teamwork or communication in the operating room. And so, um, you know, the, the, the introduction of the different team members, uh, that was important so that everyone knew who was in the, in the operating room. Uh, there were also discussion, it will go, I'll show you the checklist later, but there are also points there that talk about sharing information about what were the important or critical <coughs> events to anticipate. You heard uh, Dr. Benton talked about the blood loss, how much blood loss, what kind of supplies are needed. All these things are meant to improve the communication so that events like this, even though they may be rare, that they can be prepared for. Um, so communication, teamwork. Also other things such as standards of care. So places such as this, uh, pulse oximeters or oxygen monitoring is always, literally always present. But in other places that we'll talk about later on, they're not very common and so having them available was another point of this checklist for the WHO to say, these are standards that we would like internationally for people to, to make uh, their own. Is there a comment over here? Any, anyone else? Okay, so this is a little dramatic, but you know, here, because they had the reperfusion solution, they were able to help preserve that kidney, and they were able to flush it with the reperfusion solution and re-implant the kidney. So, um, sure. Oh. And uh, they all got up beforehand to check this. We all, we all have bowed to the checklist. Great. <laughs> you know, that, that the whole thing. That's very good. Yeah. You know, it's, uh, and we'll talk about this a little later. This, the checklist is not uh, a huge technologic innovation. It's something that people have been using checklists in their mind for hundreds of years. But it's really the formalization of the checklist and 
some, uh, a lot of thinking put into what items go into the checklist. It's really been somewhat novel here. So this is a, this is a picture of the sur surgical safety checklist as it stands. Uh, I think it's the second version that the WHO has published. And so it really is made up of three different portions. There's a, they're called pause points. So the first pause point is before the patient goes to sleep or before the induction of anesthesia. The second pause point is before the, the incision of skin. And the third pause point is right before the patient leaves a room. And so these were thought to be three critical points in the operation where we could have time to stop and also where if we pause to do these things, we could prevent complications. Uh, if you go through here, uh, the, the checklist is, to be meant to, is meant to be used by all members of the team, surgeons and anesthetists as well as nurses. And so uh, there are different portions that kind of focus on different groups. But in general, all portions can be done with all parts of the team. I'm a little surprised that this is uh, coming from the WHO. Um, is, is, it, is it clear that these checklists are um, more a stand or you know, the right thing for all international situations? Um, that's a good question. So there was a lot of debate about what exactly to include <coughs> on the checklist. As you can imagine, an a, a operating room here in Boston is very different from one in Lusaka, Zambia. And they have very different needs as well as very different cultures. And so a lot of uh, work was done to make them uh, generalizable. And so you see there are some things that here are used in Boston that aren't necessarily used in Zambia. And there are some things here in Zambia that aren't used here. And so I, you can't, I don't actually have it on this slide. I think Priya has it on her slides. But uh, one of the points of this is, is th this is a framework for people to use. And uh, people were encouraged to modify as they, as they needed for their own specific sites. So to move backwards, so what was WHO's interest in this? So WHO is a large uh, multi-international organization. And if you're thinking like they are, what they wanted was something that was applicable to all nations, something that was cheap, and something that was easy to use. I mean, if you look at most of their interventions, uh, they kind of follow that same model. A lot of it is information-based. A lot of it is uh, disseminating information as well. And so this is another way, you know, all you have to do is print it on a piece of paper, send it in an email, and there are these, uh, you, you kind of have, you've given them the framework. Um, the difficult part is actually implementing, and we'll get to that point a little later. That's a good question. Again, I forgot to mention at the very beginning that if you do have questions, please feel free to, to, to raise your hands and interrupt. Um, so this is, a little bit of background about the checklist. And you can see the items, there are only 19 items. Um, one of the concerns was that the, using the checklist would really delay the, the, the operation or increase the time it would take to operate. And it only takes about two or three minutes for the whole entire checklist to be used. Um, and so for that, you know, for, for the amount of time it takes, it's really minimal compared to the length of the case. Uh, so the clip was actually pretty accurate. Um, so they do need to this. Yeah, so they ask what procedure is going on. They talk, uh, as you can see, uh, the first question is, you know, has a patient identity site procedure and consent been uh, confirmed? And so uh, it's known to the team what the procedure was. I think that there may have been a couple, um, uh, I think it, if I remember correctly in the, in the video clip, they, they didn't, deviate too much from what we were using. They didn't show all the different parts of it, but uh, the parts that they used didn't deviate. Okay. Uh, so uh, you might ask, so does this little piece of paper really work? <laughs> uh, how, how can we really know that bringing this piece of paper into different operating rooms the, what kind of effect does this have? And so the WHO, before they, were a, the, before they put their stamp of approval on this, document, they wanted us to test it. And so, uh, firstly, the, the concept was developed, uh, multiple rounds of uh, revision with uh, international consultations were, were done to, to decide on what items to keep on the checklist. And then it was decided to do a pilot study. So this pilot study involved eight different sites. Uh, in very different settings. You had settings in Seattle, Washington, as well as Tanzania, all the way to India. And so these were very 
diverse, very different populations, very different settings, very different income levels, and they were testing all these different sites. And so the punchline is that they were found to reduce uh, more post-operative complications by almost nearly a third. And so um, to break it down even more, uh, death was decreased from 1.5% as a whole to 0.8%. Complications were decreased by uh, nearly 50, uh, 40%. Surgical site infection was also decreased by almost 50%. And an unplanned return to the operating room a decrease from 2.4 to 1.8 percent, all of which were significant. Um, in addition, you might ask, well, does this really work in uh, high-income countries? You know, for example, here in Boston, if we were to use this, where we already have relatively high standards of care, are we really seeing an impact by using these pretty basic uh, principles? A lot of these principles are already used in a lot of operating rooms, and so how much of this will really what kind of effect? And so we see, we've broken it down into high income and low and middle income countries. And um, we see a difference in complications that's statistically significant in regards to change in death rates. Uh, we don't see statistical, statistical significance in high income regions, but there's a trend towards uh, improvement from 0.9% to 0.6%. And so one of the difficulties is there's so, so few uh, deaths in these high income countries that if we actually had larger numbers, we may we may be able to show a, a significant difference. And so this is kind of where we're at now. So these studies were published in 2009. The, the pilots were done in 2008. And then as we are now, all these gold crosses are areas where the checklist is being actively used. And so you can see it spans all across all the continents, except for Antarctica. We don't have one there yet. Uh, but in multiple countries, <coughs> multiple languages, multiple settings. And so it's being used worldwide. Um, I saw a question over here. Okay. Um, have, have you or has anyone at any point uh, analyzed uh, which items on the checklist might be most critical to get into the yeah. So that's a good point. So, so a lot of these complications uh, are infectious complications. So we saw before um, surgical site infection. A lot of these surgical site infections were also, if you had any of these complications, a lot of them were surgical site infections, pneumonias, things that were considered infectious. And so um, it's, uh, we, we've done some sub-analyses, and so it looks like that there has been changes in the infectious complications as well as the non-infectious complications. So uh, one of the criticisms we've had is that, well, all this is because you're uh, asking people to give antibiotics on time, you know, something that's not being done very frequently. And sure, that, that may be a large component of it, but I think that in addition to that, um, uh, there are other parts of the checklist that are uh, contributing to the effect. I think antibiotics are playing a huge part of it. I think some of the monitoring devices that we are encouraging people to use through the checklist are, are, are um, contributing to the effect as well. So it's possible maybe with five items on the checklist you can get 95% uh, of the uh, results that you, some, not that that's good or bad, right. just kind of curious. I, I, think you're, I think that may be right, uh, but I think there's uh, probably more of kind of a the teamwork communication bit that's going into it. So, you know, if you look at unplanned return to the operation, operating room, I don't know exactly what part of the checklist contributes to that. You know, what part of this of these 19 items really prevents the need to go back to the operating room? I don't really know. But what it does suggest is maybe we're doing the operations better uh, in general, and so it's maybe some of that. And, and this is something that's very difficult to capture scientifically. But I think there's, there, there's something else behind the checklist than just the items on the checklist. It's actually the process of using this. And I think, in my experience, it's actually this idea of uh, we want to use this. We're interested in quality improvement. And so therefore, uh, that kind of culture that's changed by using this type of tool uh, is what kind of adds to that, that effect. And I think this goes a lot towards uh, some of the technologies that you've talked about here. Uh, Technologies are great uh, and they do help, uh, but really you need the people using them to have an interest in them. You need the people who are using them to want to improve. And so that kind of catalyst, I think, makes a big difference. Go here. You don't, you don't think you'll get IRB approval for a leave one out uh, experiment? Uh, I think we could. Um, I think we could, if you leave a, a portion out. Yeah. I think you'd have to leave 19 portions out or just do 19 separate experiments, but um, uh, we could. 
I'll go here and then over here. Um, uh, we are certainly seeing a difference in uh, the, I guess, the buy-in into uh, the checklist. And you've probably read about some of this. You know, you have your laggards, you have your early adopters, and you have kind of the people in between. And so we certainly have a lot of early adopters. But in a lot of these hospitals, especially in some of these limited resource areas, there are a lot of laggards who are, are comfortable with what they're doing, they are, don't want to change, and, uh, and in general it seems that people who are beginning their training and may have more kind of fear in the operating room, they're the people who seem to, to grasp onto these tools more. I just think that it's an example where we talked before about being able to collect data accurately in clinical settings as being one of the most important things you can do with an information system, because that gives you some of the background data that lets you answer some of these questions. Mm -hmm. so, Whatever the ethics of doing a you know one out type of study, which you know it's certainly one of the more definitive ways of doing this. If you knew more about the nature of the complications, more about the kind of things that were going on with routine surgical cases, with with a, a simple but you know useful core data set, then I think that would be much would be very much easier to, to look at this and see right. whether you actually want to revise the checklist in other ways. Right. Not lagging. Right. I, I think that's a key point. You know, data collection. We'll get, I'll, I have a couple slides later on that talk about the importance of data collection, but uh, it certainly is, uh, helps you understand what's going on here a lot better. Priya? I just wanted to respond to two questions. One about the need of items of the checklist, and two, the sort of attrition factor, perhaps you just have to wait for the old stone and then be <laughs> <laughs> Yeah, um, I was just wondering, actually, if you look at the um, Korean, I think it's Korean Air, they have, you know, they have a checklist in place, a pilot checklist has been around since the 1930s. And when they analyze it, it's very long story short, they go on to Americans or they go to Korea and say, well, what's going on? Which panel is that thing? And his solution was, I think you should speak English in the cockpit. So that's your solution to our accidents, you know, you arrogant person. And he said, no, what's happening is you're bringing your culture into the cockpit with your language. And the culture is very hierarchical. So the pilot is the old one who's experienced and the co-pilot even though he's supposed to be able to collect it, can't because, well, you know, can't collect someone who's older than you. And if you just speak English, you're changing the culture in the cockpit. And it's that empowering the younger persons, it's empowering the nurses in the OR who, you know, it's been shown they won't say anything. They'll see that mistakes are happening and they'll just say, well, you know, kind of whisper it. Surgeons just don't hear. So I think that teamwork and cultural component is critical to the checklist and it's really critical Go ahead. What are the issues for institutional support? Yeah. Um, so the you know uh, in general, in my experience, so the uh, the institution. Do you mean you mean as a as a hospital as a whole? What would be the so in general? I, I found that people are really supportive of this from an administrative point of view. It costs very little. Uh, all you have to do is ask the surgeons, nurses, and anesthesiologists to do it. And so, but that's been the challenge, finding uh, ways to ask people to change the culture of the, of the practice there. And so really, uh, the idea of accepting it seems easy, but actually practicing it seems difficult. And so kind of getting buy-in from all your laggards, all, and really all it takes is a couple people to badmouth it to make it a, a, a difficult experience. Yeah. So there are, and I'm going to talk a little bit about one of those places, and I'll, 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 uh, I'd say there are some places that are very used to having top-down direction, and so in one of the countries, I, uh, I'm going to talk about Moldova, they're a East, former Soviet Union uh, country, uh, and they're kind of used to the dictum comes from the top and we do what they say, whereas in Zambia, which I'll talk about a little bit later, we're having a difficult time there because um, even though that's the case, there is a lot of... Uh, uh, this hierarchy thing is, uh, I don't know, there's just a lot of bureaucracy there, and so it doesn't seem to be moving as, as, as uh, smoothly. Uh, so this is uh, one of our checklists that we're using in the University Teaching Hospital in Lusaka, Zambia. 
And I'm going to move now to, we've talked about the checklist as a whole kind of briefly. Now I'm going to move to kind of limited resource areas or, or lower middle income, lower income countries. And so, uh, as I mentioned, there are 19 items. These are all the same 19 items. But one of the difficulties with this is if the WHO wants to support this, what do you do about these, this portion here, pulse oximetry? So uh, pulse oximeter is a, is a uh, technology developed in the 80s uh, that is used to measure oxygen saturation or the level of oxygen in the blood. And so when you're under general anesthesia, uh, you're sedated and you may not breathe as well. And so as a result, your oxygen level decreases. If your oxygen level is low enough, you can have your, your heart can stop. You can have other uh, injuries as well. Some people might say that your, um, your ability to heal your wounds or your, your perfusion to different parts of your body is, is, is worse. And so uh, these little boxes, I have a picture. Um, actually, that's not the picture I want. But they're, they're quite expensive. In the United States, if you were to, if you were to buy one, it's about $1,200 per unit. And so if you can imagine in the, this teaching hospital that has 12 operating rooms, uh, to buy 12 of them is quite a significant resource intense task for them to do. And so the WHO, um, what we set out to do was to show that pulse oximetry was actually something that was important to, for ministries and for uh, countries to consider how to make these more accessible for their, for their uh, countries. In addition to that, the WHO is, has uh, worked as a procurement uh, body to procure uh, drugs as well as devices. And so the thought was if we can show that this is actually a very important thing, that this package of the checklist and pulse oximetry would be worth the WHO investing their, their time and efforts into developing a procurement of these to, to provide for low-income countries. And so this is a picture of the, one of the new OR suites in the Brigham Women's Hospital. Very nice. You can see the flat screen TVs. You can get uh, there are Bose speakers in there, so if you want some music, you can listen to music while you're operating. So they're very nice operating suites. Uh, bring them women's. And so they're, if you look in the back wall, all those are supplies. There's all the different types of sutures, all the sponges, all the little gadgets you would ever want. This is in Zambia, a little different. If you can see the anesthesia machine up in the top left, it's basically a tubing and a little bag that you, you, know, you, you, you squeeze. Uh, this is the operating room table, not as comfortable as the other one. Uh, Equipment uh, available, maybe a couple of sponges, a couple uh, sutures. That's about it. Uh, so it's, it's a very different uh, setting. Moving to Eastern Europe, this is Moldova. Maybe a little bit more developed and a little bit more equipment there. Uh, but if you actually look closely at the equipment, it's all very old. It's all reused. Uh, if you can look at some of the laparoscopic uh, devices there, which I was surprised to see laparoscopy there, but they're all things that are generally disposable in the United States, used once, but they use multiple times. And something that you never really see here, there's two patients in the same room. And this, they have 12 operating rooms. There are 22 beds or operating tables. So most of their operating rooms have multiple tables and you can imagine kind of how crowded and how disorganized things are, as well as infectious risks. You have this many people coming in and out, moving around. Uh, and if you can think of some of the errors that can happen here, think of the noise that's going on here. If someone needs something, well, I didn't hear you because so-and-so is yelling over here. There's just, uh, it's just a different place. And so what we wanted to show is in these limited, these poor uh, regions that we could actually implement the checklist on a hospital-wide basis. In addition to that, we wanted to show that we could actually affect change and we could bring in these pulse oximeters and show a difference. So I'm going to move along quickly. Uh, this is a picture of a pulse oximeter. It shows heart rate as well as oxygen saturation. And uh, in a study in The Lancet that was published last year, um, evidence showed that in high income countries, virtually all operating rooms have pulse oximetry. And it's an international standard. If you look at all the countries that have standards of anesthetic monitoring, they're on all the monitoring standards. Um, so it's an international standard of monitoring care. But in low-income countries, they're absent from more than 50% of those operating rooms. And so our aims were basically to see if we could bring the checklist in and the pulse oximeters and show that there was a difference, and then to show the effect of pulse oximetry training and show a trend in improvement in hypoxemia over time. And so in addition to these um, eight sites, we added three more sites, one in Honduras, one in Moldova, and one in Zambia. 
I'm going to talk about Moldova and Zambia today because we're furthest along there. We're still working with Honduras. We don't have too much information from there yet. But uh, speaking about the implementation plan, so we this is kind of the schema that we use to implement. It's very basic, um, and there's a lot more detail that goes along with it, but this is the, the basic principles were we wanted a local team to be the implementation team, someone, a local team to really take charge. We wanted to provide didactic education as well as demonstration. We encourage role play and then we did coaching and feedback. And so the, the thought was at the WHO, the, the School of Public Health and the World Federation Society of Anesthesiologists, we would provide oversight to the local implementation as well as the local administration. And then they would then take this and teach it to their operating room staff and hopefully we'd find change. And along this, kind of the backbone of all this was data collection. In order to to prove the things we wanted to show, we needed to have robust data collection. And so through uh, funding through the WHO, we were able to pay for data collectors in all these different areas. Uh, and so this is just a demonstration of how the local implementation team taught. Uh, I'll get to you in just a minute. So in, we, we had demonstrations as well as right in the operating room teaching on how to use a checklist. We had these big posters placed on the wall. And this is a local anesthesiologist teaching nurses about the checklist. And this here is a surgeon teaching uh, the anesthetist, how to use a checklist. Quick question over here. Uh, so it's, uh, it's about 30,000 per site. So not... 30,000 per site? Correct. And so you might think that's a lot. That's a lot to me. But um, if you consider the amount of uh, data collection that occurred and, and uh, the resources used, it, it was actually, as studies go, quite a low budget study. And so these are some of the results we see in Moldova. This is just one of the sites. We haven't quite seen significant differences in death yet and mortality, but there's a trend from 4% to 3.6%. Complication rates have gone down by almost 60%. Surgical site infection also almost about 60%. Pneumonia has decreased by almost uh, from 47 to 2.9%. And unplanned intubation has also decreased. And so some of this I think we've seen before, any complications, surgical site infections, but things that are a little bit different that I think are added by the pulse oximeters are the need to, the, the prevention of unplanned intubations as well as maybe, maybe pneumonia. Uh, but I think um, we're seeing the same thing. We're seeing a redu reduction in complications overall by using the checklist. Uh, here's a, uh, some figure, a figure showing the, the uh, decrease in hypoxemic episodes per 1,000 oximetry hours. So the bars in blue are periods where someone's oxygen level is just marginal from less than 90. Uh, and you can see this sharp decrease from the early period to the middle period, and then again, just a little bit more from the late period. The other thing we wanted to catch was to see, well, if people are having low oxygen levels, uh, what if they're, are we preventing the, the severity of those low, low, uh, low oxygen levels? Uh, so we looked at four minutes as well. So if someone's having a, a greater than four minute period of hypoxemia, that would be what we consider a severe episode. And so those have also gone down. So not only have we been able to decrease the amount of hypoxemia in general, but also the severity of the hypo hypoxemia. How does it differ from uh, what you have in the United States? You know, I, uh, so the number of hypoxemia, it, it, I don't have the numbers right off the top of my head, but it's less than 1% really. For, uh, uh, and I don't, I don't have it broken down. It, so I would say that the rate of hypoxemia is twice that of here in the United States. The, there is a recent study that looked at um, actually the MGH and a, a tertiary hospital in Auckland, New Zealand. And so we, considering those as high income countries, their rates of hypoxemia were about half of what we see here in Moldova. And so this is the schema. We're hoping to show that, we know that checklists can save lives. We know that pulse oximetry is essential to safe surgery. Uh, implementation, we hope we've shown that they can, implementation of this, this package uh, improves outcomes. And then lastly, um, we hope that this can become a universal standard. So we're going to move on. Uh, thank you very much. Yeah, it's a it's a machine that they can use till till it breaks. Uh, but we uh, we didn't feel like it was right to take them there and take them away. So we've all the sites we've gone to are are 
we've left the oximeters there with replacement probes for them to use. So Alvin talked about his experience of the use of safe surgery checklists in surgery, and then also the implementation. And what you'll notice on his first slide, it said the WHO safe surgery checklist. And we quickly realized that you can't just drop checklists over sub-Saharan Africa and Asia and hope that it will function and have the impact. And so you'll see on my slide it says the Safe Childbirth Checklist Program, because as you all know, having the technology on its own isn't going to work. You need to have some kind of supportive element, however skinny that element is. So I'm going to take us to a different scenario, and I'm actually going to focus on the early stages, because when we came, when I entered, there was no checklist. We had to actually create the checklist. So I'm going to talk about the development of the checklist a bit more than the implementation of it. So what are the principles? The purpose is to ensure that essential care practices are reliably performed. That's doing the right thing to the right patient at the right time every single time. It has to be evidence-based. So there is nothing new on any of these checklists. The innovation is the tool. So you're actually providing good care at the bedside. It's not the items on the checklist, and that's important for acceptability later on in the process. Then succinct and simple. Everyone wants to add items onto the checklist. The more items you add on, the longer it takes. And the field that we're working in, high burden sort of in the developing world, they already have a shortage of healthcare workers. They don't have time. So everything on it must be absolutely mandatory and affects mortality or severe mor morbidity. And it's a bedside tool. You want something to be easy to use at the bedside. Broad applicability, you asked that question, you know, is this for Africa, is this for the US? Um, it's important for scale up, that every item is essential and therefore should be done all over the world. So when we were in the middle of the development, the other person that's working with me is a neonatologist and um, he, his wife was having his first baby at Beth Israel, very good hospital in Boston. And he'd forgotten about it throughout the whole process of having the baby because he was so traumatised. But then at the end, he was like, oh, I have the checklist. Took it out the back of his pocket. I was like, OK, so have they done the things that they should have done after delivery? And no, they hadn't. They'd missed two items. One was they hadn't got the breastfeeding going within an hour, which we know should be done. And second, they hadn't checked the temperature of the baby. His baby was hypothermic, had a lower temperature than it should have. And it's fine. We're in America. Put it on the heat, it'll be fine. But that wouldn't have happened in Africa. Um, so it should be applicable all over. And then the capacity for measurable impact, like you said, if you can't prove meaningful change, you won't build program support, especially in medical areas where people want to know what they're doing, has an evidence base, show me the numbers. Yeah? And so you have to be able to measure what um, impact you're having. It's not comprehensive. This checklist is not to prevent every conceivable patient harm. It's focused on the big bang, you know, the mortality and the severe morbidity. And it's not a protocol or guideline. So people are like, oh, okay, so this is what I do to deliver a baby. No, no. You need to have training and you need to be able to know what to do. So it's a bit like a shopping list. You give your know, partner a shopping list, go and get tomatoes. You don't tell him how to pick the tomatoes. You just say, I need some tomatoes. And same with the pilot checklist. You can't say, oh, well, you don't need pilot training. They're just reminders. So we've sort of got a bit of a schema on checklist development and then checklist testing. And so it's assembling the evidence on critical omissions that will lead to harm then identifying the pause points and actually drafting the checklist items. This actually, Boeing and the aviation industry spend a lot of time on this, and we got them to help us, both with the safe surgery checklist and with the safe childbirth checklist. And this guy, his name's Dan Borman, this is his sort of what he does in life. He's like, this has to be the font, this should be the size, put your action item at the front of the sentence, and all these things matter. He's like, when people are doing this quickly, they, your wording needs to be perfect. <clears throat> And then the next process, which is an iterative process, getting experts and field users. It's actually pretty painful, um, but it's hugely important for scale up later on. So quick story on this. Um, we had an international consultation because it's a WHO thing, so you have to have an international consultation. Who's who of safe childbirth in the room? The first comment was that the neonatologists and the obstetrician sat there and said, we've never been in the same room for an intervention. Day one of baby has always been argued over. The obstetricians will say it's mine, and the neonatologists say it's mine, and they've just never come together. Um, which, at all being a surgeon, I was like, 
the hell's going on here? Um, and then he sat there, and I really liked the way he navigated the process. There was controversy over everything. You know, one academic said, no, for PPH we should be doing this, and someone else said this, and he was like, oh my God, I have two days, and we need to have a draft checklist at the end. But I said, you know, what's going on? Like, we're not really seeming to get anywhere. And he said, Priya, we have to have the controversial topics coming out now because you don't want them coming out halfway through your testing. And I think that's critical. Like, know your landscape, whichever intervention or innovation you're creating. And it was really important for buy-in. The other thing was that, yes, we had all the academics, but we also had field users. We had the midwives from Kenya and Tanzania, et cetera. And when the academics were fighting over minutiae, and then they were saying, well, maybe we shouldn't have a checklist. You know, we can't really decide what should be on the checklist. I remember the Kenyan midwife stood up and said, just this draft, this like draft prototype number one, <clears throat> can I photocopy it and take it? Because this will make a real difference. And actually, this happened over the process. You know, we had a WebEx later on in the process. And again, it was midwives on the front line saying, I don't really care about the minutiae. I just want to start using this because I know it will make a difference. So the next stage, now this was squashed for the safe surgery. They had eight sites and they sort of did the pilot study. For the safe childbirth, <clears throat> we uh, separated it. So we have a pilot study, which I'll talk about briefly, if I can get rid of the fog in my throat, in India, which is just one center. And then we're moving on to the randomized control trial because academics want the randomized control trial to prove that it has an impact on mortality. So we see as the first step is, is there improvement? in processes. And then the second step is, does this improvement in process lead to reduced number of deaths? Now, dissemination seems to be falling off the slide, but actually it's where WHO sits. And I think dissemination is something you need to think about right at the beginning of your process. And through the process, I've been thinking, why did we start working with WHO? Actually, they are critical for when the tool's been proven to disseminate across the world. And so even though it was painful working with them at times, they are now crucial for getting the message out. Um, and um, if anyone has ideas for where we could put the Safe Childbirth Checklist in terms of a good program, then let me know, because ER's ended. Um, so we're thinking of the next soap opera. <laughs> so I just want to talk about a few points. This is a Safe Surgery Checklist. This is the pause point. When you're identifying the pause points, there have to be natural breaks in your clinical workflow. So you want them, I mean, the safe surgery was perfect. Like when people get together and they're about to start a case, you're already sort of talking and chatting, pick up a checklist. At the end, when the patient leaves, <coughs> natural pause point, pick up the checklist. For childbirth, there was a little bit of anxiety over where we were going to create these natural breaks. And the reason it's important to be natural, you don't want too much behavior change happening. So you want people to feel like it's completely normal to then have to pick up the checklist and do something. Um, critical omissions. These are things that if you don't do, you will cause severe harm. And they make up your checklist items. As we spoke about, every single one of our checklists says, this checklist is not intended to be comprehensive. Additions and modifications to fit local practice are encouraged. That's not just about humility. Actually, we realize that local ownership is really important. So they don't want some tool from America being landed in Zambia and saying, use this, you'll be great, because we know everything. They want to be able to modify and say, well, we need to tweak this, or this is important. It has to be a controlled process, because what's on the checklist is evidence-based. You know, It's taken a long time to agree. And so we actually now have a bit of a process on how you decide what comes on and off. And generally, you'll find people want to add lots on. So we have a bit of a rule. If you're going to add one off, you probably need to take one off. Um, the other thing is, does it actually impact mortality? So for childbirth, everyone's like, you want to put a pesiotomy on? Like, mm. So that's like a cut instead of tearing. And I'm like, well, is that actually going to prevent deaths? No. Okay, well, perhaps we won't put it on the checklist. But it is important to get their local buy-in and for them to feel it's their tool. And then we spoke a little bit about this. It's that magical ingredient. So processes, like giving antibiotics, are important in the developing world because they're not doing it. Most of these processes people are doing in the developed world, and yet there was still a difference. And there I think it's that, oh, that's very kind, thank you. Um, I love MIT. Um, uh, this is where, I mean, my sister's uh, trained to be a pilot, and her second lecture was she got handed this book on human factors. 
and I picked it up. It's something you've discussed. And I was like, oh, this is great. And she looked at me and went, hang on a minute. You're making life-death decisions all the time. Have you not read this book on human factors? And I was like, uh, no, actually, we were just told you go to med school, you read your books, you do good training, and you're God, and everything will be fine. And she was like, oh, right. And she said, what about crew resource management? And I was like, what's that? She says, well, when we go into the cockpit, we have moments to create an effective team. And the effective team is important not when the flight's going well, it's important when there's an emergency. And I had, I'm an obs obstetrician, and I remember doing this procedure where I needed blood in the middle of the case. And I yell, no one ever knows who the millions of people are in theatre, right? So I yell off to this woman, go get me blood. And 20 minutes later, I'm like, where's the blood? Getting angry that the blood hasn't arrived. And I look at her, and she's like, I'm just an observer. I don't know where the blood is. And I was like, oh, I really should know who was my, like, circulating nurse. And that's the ma magical ingredient behind this. This sort of confirm who you are, let's all sit together. The other component that went with the checklist was the briefing. Like, you all got together and discussed the cases of the day. So I come from the UK. It was mandated across hospitals. Someone was talking about institutional support. But everyone had to do it. And people were like, oh, God, this is going to be such a nightmare. But the briefing really helped. So we, one of the incentives we used is we timed our day. So if I had six operations, normally that would start at nine with faff in between and finish at 6.30, an hour and a half after everyone should have left. We started timing the day and recording it. And we were reducing the time because there was less sort of, you know, messing around between cases. So the nurses were able to leave an hour earlier. So there's, there's a lot to be said for that teamwork communication component that we can't really measure. So as I said, our challenge was MDGs four and five, we know that we're having all this mortality and we know the causes. And what's really sad is that we have proven interventions that are inexpensive. And WHO has been trying to deliver these effectively for decades and we've been totally unable to get them to the bedside reliably. It's a slightly different challenge to the safe surgery checklist. So 99% of our burden of disease is in the developing world. And why that's important is it's got to be very succinct. These uh, caregivers don't have excess time and second we can't have like intense supply requirements because they probably won't have the resources there consistently available again we don't have surgeons that have had some kind of training some of the caregivers in these places have just been taught how to do some deliveries in the last six months or minimal training so again it had to be a slightly different tool the high risk period that you want to cover with the checklist well ours could cover weeks you know, days to weeks, someone comes in on a Monday, by the time they've delivered and they're being discharged, it could be sort of five days later. It covers many rooms, it covers multiple caregivers, and it could be across facilities, like someone gets referred. So how is this checklist going to cover all these situations? And we don't have an obvious team structure to work with. In some situations, you'll just have the one midwife in the little health facility. So put those in reds, because they were challenges. Some people felt the next one should be a challenge. The woman's well. <coughs> You know, pregnancy isn't a disease, and she's awake. What does that mean? Do we just bypass her, or do we include her in the team? I've put it in orange because I actually think it's a benefit. And then the advantage we had is that we've actually got a good evidence base for safe childbirth compared to safe surgery. Don't worry about the detail. The reason I brought this slide up is we used every single source of information we could find. Published, unpublished literature, opinion, getting experts together. And it was all to ensure that there wasn't something that we hadn't covered that would come up later on in the program, uh, process of forming this checklist. So how do you decide on your high-risk period? Well, we were sort of given that. It's the 24-hour high-risk period where, you know, from admission to discharge. Um, but how do you decide on your pause points? As I said, pause point one and four were quite easy. And then, yeah, go ahead. So, where are the deaths? Ah, so the <clears throat> highest number of deaths are actually from uh, at delivery, so labor to delivery, and then um, postpartum, so the first 48 hours. Um, so, that's why we said, right, we'll cover admission to discharge. <clears throat> So we cover all the way from discharge, uh, any discharge from facilities. So actually the tool covers, if someone's discharged within six hours, it'll only cover that. If someone's discharged within a week, we'll cover the whole week. Um, and the two middle pause points were the sort of fudge factor. Now, ideally, you'd have a pause point 
one minute after delivery, because that's where you want the oxytocin to be given to prevent hemorrhage. But one minute, someone's got gloves on and they're in the midst of stuff. They're not going to pick up a checklist. And the other time you'd want a checklist is actually every time you do an examination during labour. But then our checklist would be really long. And so again, the checklist would sink. So there is a compromise in what's actually going to be effectively implemented. Again, it's not about the details. People say, I'm going to I'm going to make a checklist and then I'm going to trial it next week. This took two years. And yes, a lot of this is because we were working with WHO. We wanted to get the acceptability, worldwide acceptability of everyone. And all that takes a long time. And I'm not saying it has to take two years to make a checklist. I'm just saying that if you want that acceptability across the board and you are thinking of worldwide global scale up, then it's a long process. <clears throat> and this is the who's who of safe childbirth and everyone we spoke to. Their network was wide. All the red dots, they either have research going on there, they've worked there, they have contacts there. And we, the green dots represent where we did usability feedback. So it wasn't testing. We said to these people, please take this tool. Try it on one or two deliveries. So IHI is all about starting small. We did that in the sort of crafting method. We said, okay, you take this and then we'll have a call with you and you change and the checklist however you want. And so at the end, we had sort of 11 checklists and then we were going to combine them. And this is what happened. There's, it's a two-sided checklist. What, it's four pause points. The first is the two one before delivery. And at the end, at, on the other side is the two pause points after delivery. And what I just wanted to show you on this is this is revision 67. And I'm sure by the time it gets onto WHO website, it'll be 88 or something. And what I wanted to show you on this is two differences between um, this one and the safe surgery because of what we're dealing with. So I told you about the variability of the caregiver. You can say, does the mother need to start antibiotics? I don't know, because you, you can't rely on their training. So in America, we'd hope to get rid of the second column, because they don't need to be told when to do things. But for these settings, it was crucial that we gave them the criteria. And we were really anxious. We're like, oh, the font's small, Boeing didn't like it. You know, there's way too much stuff on the checklist. The feedback we got was that was critical. And actually, in the modification stage, that ended up being a fabulous training tool because when they discussed the criteria for things, they're like, oh, I didn't know that. And why did we do this? And actually, the midwives were learning as they were discussing the checklist. The second component in Oval is that's how we decided to include the mother and her birth companion. We actually said, right, you're a member of this team. We're going to tell you these are the danger signs that you should be calling the healthcare worker for. It's not like in England where you have one midwife you know, to one patient. You have one midwife to sometimes 25 patients delivering. Well, let them be part of the process. Why don't you call us when you need us? And that was informed. So I'm going to take you to four hours from Goa, lovely weather, um, a rural health centre called Gokok. It's the levels in India, sort of primary health centre, then a community health centre, then a district hospital. And this was like an upgraded community health centre, about 4,000 deliveries a year, one or two obstetricians, depending on whether they felt like coming in, and majority of the nurses doing the deliveries. But they rotate around the hospital, so they're not just obstetric nurses. They've never had quality improvement. They've never been touched by research. They just keep trying to do the work that they can. And this is the classic scene, corridors full of people. The doctor in there has got to see these people in the next hour um, because he's got three hour clinic and there's, this is about a third of the patients. They have a supplies board which they update in the mornings. And unsurprisingly, the two things that are really important to prevent bleeding after labor, they don't have. The preeclampsia patients, high risk patient here would be in high dependency unit with lots of monitors, she's in the corridor. And they actually do have a fetal monitor. It just hasn't worked for three years. It's being used as a shelf. And I'm slightly anxious about that uncovered needle because it's probably being reused. What were the objectives? So the objectives were actually looking at processes. We know that these interventions will reduce mortality. WHO has done all that research. Can we get the healthcare providers to reliably deliver these interventions to every single woman that comes through? And so it was a really simple pre-post. Um, we wanted the intervention thing to be really skinny. So it was a one-day launch. 
Because ideally, what I'd like to see is someone can download the checklist, you know, have a bit of a video, have a manual, and run with it. So it was one day launch, and then four days sort of supportive. We weren't there for the four days. We got the um, one of our implementing people to sort of support them. And the implementing person was anaesthetist, full-time anaesthetist. She's been there for 20 years, so she's credible. Um, people like her, but also respect her. She did this on top of her usual workload, so we weren't sort of drafting more workforce in. And she led the launch day. We trained her for a day, and she led it. She explained the why. So she got the nurses to share stories of, you know, what's happening, the adverse outcomes, near misses. She then shared some basic baseline data. So we could have just shared all our baseline data. We'd collected it for three months. But we said, well, that's not feasible. You know, they're not going to be able to collect that data in these kind of settings. So she just shared a few items and then did the modification process. So sat down with them, said, what do you think? Let's go through the items. It was a bit of a training session. And then the video for the safe surgery, they'd made the video at Brigham and they transported it. And what we decided was that we would make it on site. And it's sort of based on the Chinese proverb, you know, tell me and I'll forget, show me and I'll remember, involve me and I'll understand. And you could see the bulbs going on. So the chief medical officer, who was supposed to be our local institutional leader, he sort of, we're making the video with him. And he's like, so what do I have to do? I was like, you have to ask the question, you know, is oxytocin ready? And he's like, is oxytocin ready? Can I start the operation? No, you need to wait for the response. And you could see the sort of light was going on as we were making this video. And at the end, he was like, wow, this is great. And then we drafted two very sort of low-level nurses and just brought them in. We were like, right, all you have to do is read this checklist, go through, and we're just videoing you. And I heard afterwards, he said, this checklist is really easy. I mean, I had no training. They called me in, they videoed me, and I don't think we're going to have a problem. So it was, it was actually really useful doing the video on site. And then the other thing that Alvin mentioned was role plays. I really, really think role plays for something like this is critical because that's when they understand what's happening and adults don't want to be sitting like you guys are sitting listening to me. Like Adults want to be on the ground doing stuff. And so that's when they really got to understand what, was, uh, what the checklist was about. And so I sort of have made this like little pyramid. So yes, the safe childbirth checklist is really the main component, but the program bit is your implementing person, so your child improve, childbirth improvement coordinator. And then we didn't have a teamwork component. On our checklist, there wasn't any introduce yourself. And we realized that that was critical from the safe surgery. So we said, I'll tell you what, why don't you just get all the labor people together in your facility once a day, get them to introduce themselves, and just motivate them to use the checklist. I thought she wasn't going to do it. She thought the idea was absolutely rubbish. Why do I want to know the names of the nurses that are doing the deliveries? At the end, she said it was fabulous because when she was going home, she knew what was going on. She said it was the best way of knowing, like getting a really quick safety assessment of the day, like what, who were the high-risk patients. So I think it's an aspect that she's going to take on now the study's ended. I've only circled these two bits because we actually used um, uh, observers to collect data. So we didn't want to have like the people who are actually using the checklist sort of saying, yes, we used it and this is what we did. So we actually drafted in five very junior people to actually observe what they were doing. Quickly on the results, every single essential standard that was on the checklist improved a lot. Uh, I'll show you the graphs. And then overall, they were probably delivering 10 out of the 29 essential standards on average before. And afterwards, they were delivering 25 out of the 29 standards, reliably. And even though the study wasn't powered for mortality, there was a significant drop in the fresh stillbirths, probably because they were actually monitoring the fetus during labour. And this is some of the fuzzy stuff. That, I say fuzzy because I'm not a qualitative researcher, but I went out and I, we were doing interviews, and um, they were talking about how the, the actual checklist is a catalyst for change, that we don't, you know, it's not what we measure and we don't expect. So before I told you, like, the oxytocin and the drugs weren't available, well, there's something about being on the checklist that helps the institution say, well, oh, okay, these are really important items. We're going to focus on these and the availability increases. Then they've instituted different changes, like, well, she said, well, you want us to do a check one hour after birth, but the woman's all over the hospital at that point. So they shifted things around. This was just a nurse on the ground. She said, I'm just going to create a bay. 
And there, every woman who delivers is going to go there, she's going to have her checklist done, her check done out now, and then she'll move to the postnatal um, wards and, you know, wherever she's going to go. So there were lots of little changes that happened to enable the checklist to be effectively delivered. So it's sort of like operations management, but they led on that. The second thing I noticed when I was out there and the nurses said was the patients started asking whether this facility had become a private facility because they noticed that their care was improving and would they have to pay more? And it was a great feedback mechanism because that made the nurses happier. And at the end of the day, you want to provide good care. But when your workload's crazy, you're just providing whatever. And now they had this checklist. They said, this is great. We do this and we provide good care. And the patients are loving us. And they were giving a few extra rupees at the end, you know, backhand deals. And the, ex the other thing was that the checklist was beginning to be used as a handover tool. So normally, if they did a bit of a tag team, it'd be like, okay, woman in labor, had three children before, buy them off to lunch. And now they were saying, oh, actually, no, I did check that. And actually, high, her, she's got high blood pressure. And I think she might be at risk of bleeding. So even their communication was improving. And these are changes that you don't really expect, but happen because you've introduced an innovation. I don't need to look at any of the detail on this, apart from dark blue is pre and light blue is post. And you can see that some have drastically improved. Hand hygiene, i.e. wash your hands with soap and water and use gloves, 0.3% before, 99% after. I mean, some of the things they were doing fine before, but even though statistically improved, every single item improved hugely. And people say, well, that's fair enough, but what about sustainability? You're in a study environment. So I went three weeks later after the study, and um, we'd said we wouldn't provide checklists. Like, if they wanted the checklist, they, the institution had to buy them. But the chief medical officer was away, and it's a very centralised process. And um, so there were no checklists. So I said, oh, what have you been doing? And I said, well, for the first week, we used posters, but we really think it's about the piece of paper. And I said, so what have you done? And they said, well, we just pooled our money, we had a little bit of money saved up, and every nurse gave, I don't know, it must have been like 10 rupees or something, and they went to the Xerox Centre and photocopy checklists for themselves. They said, we might get the money back, we might not, but we're providing better care this way. I was like, wow, and they don't get paid a lot, and they're putting their own money towards something. That's acceptability. Um, and the next steps. So, yes, there's the randomised control trial, uh, but lots of people are saying, well, do we really have to wait for three years before we get this checklist out? Like, what's the harm? I looked at the caesarean section rates. They're not going up. No, you're not going to cause death. And it's a question. And uh, it's a question for you guys, and it's a question for the field. Like, do we have to wait for the RCT before simple innovations like this are rolled out? Oh, sorry, randomised control trial. So it's like you know, the big shebang that the academics like. Well, I don't know. I don't know the answer to this. And I, I, I think there is um, an argument to be had. And then the use of technology. And again, it's something that you can answer better than us. I actually think that, yes, the checklist could be put on a mobile phone. Like, yes, that's one thing. But, you know, I think there's more than that. Like, could it be used for data collection? Could it be used for training? Like, where does technology fit in with these innovations? And it's a thing that hasn't been sort of considered in, you know, the Atul Gawande group. And I think it's, you know, I'm sure Leo's thought about this. Like, how do we start using innovative technology to support these innovations? So, that's a quick run through the Safe Childhood Checklist.